In this video, I'm going to be talking about landscape and cityscape photography. Alright, so let's start off with some composition tips. A basic tip is to use the rule of thirds to emphasize either the sky or landscape. Another one is to create images with foreground, middle ground, and background elements. So what do I mean by this? So the rule of thirds means that you take your frame that you're looking through, the frame of your photo when you're looking through the camera, and you divide it up into thirds, kind of like a tic-tac-toe. And you put important elements along um, any of these lines or at the intersections of these lines. So this is a perfect example of using the rule of thirds. Um, this, in this photo, we're emphasizing the sky by putting the horizon on this bottom third line. This means that two thirds of the photo is gonna be the sky and that's where your eye is gonna to go to most. Along with that, we're also using the idea of having a background, which would be this sky over here, the middle ground, which are all of these um, mountains and such, and the foreground element, which is the stack of rocks. Let's look at another example. So this rule of thirds photo is emphasizing the landscape. This time the horizon is placed on the top line, which means that the landscape is actually taking up two thirds of the photo. And again, we also have this idea of background, which is these far mountains and the sky, middle ground, which is like this lake area, and then the foreground is this guy sitting on the hilltop. These rules are two really easy ways to make more interesting landscape photos. Now when it comes to camera settings, you generally want to use a small aperture so you have a deep depth of field. So this means that more of the scene is in the area that will be in focus. And since this, using a small aperture means you're letting in less light, you need to have um, a longer slash slower shutter speed. So you may need a tripod, especially when you're getting into low light times of the day, such as dusk and night. So here is an example of what using different apertures um, means and what kind of depth of field it means. So if you use a large aperture, such as 2.8, you have a shallow depth of field that means that only the area from around these flowers to around these flowers is going to be in focus, which includes our figure. If you use a small aperture, and when I say small, I'm referring to how big the lens opening is actually opening up. This is small, this is large. Um, but f22 is a small aperture, and you have a deep depth of field. That means that Everywhere from right around here in these flowers to all the way back here are actually in focus. So this is usually what most people use for landscape photography. You want to be able to see your foreground figure, your middle ground, and your background nice and in focus. Now if we were just doing portrait photography, um, let's say we wanted to do a portrait and just focus on the figure here, using that shallow depth of field is usually more often used because it really makes your eye focus in on the central figure. Well, when you're photographing landscapes, some people prefer to freeze the motion of water, such as crashing waves, and that requires a fast shutter speed, while showing motion or flowy water means you need a long shutter speed and usually a tripod. So here's an example, side-by-side -side example. We have the same ISO, and if you remember from our earlier lectures, ISO refers to how sensitive the film or your camera sensor is to light. ISO 100 means there's, it's not very sensitive to light, so you're going to get a nice fine detail and you won't have very much grain or noise. So in this case, we have f1.4. That's a large aperture. That means that the lens opening is opening up a lot more and we have a very fast shutter speed of one four thousandth of a second. 
When I say one four thousandth of a second, it literally means if you took a second of time, divided it into four thousand little pieces of time, and the shutter is just going at one of those four thousandth of a seconds. So you can see here that the water is frozen in time. We can see the flow of it. Now on this side, we have the same ISO, but we've um, gone ahead and slowed down that shutter speed to 1 13th of a second. So that means that if I took one second, divided it into 13, and just and took the photo with 1 13th of that time, then that's the time that the shutter speed is. Along with that, in order to balance out the light that's coming in, we needed to change our aperture to f13 to let less light in. We're letting in a lot more light with the slow shutter speed, so we need to let less light in with the aperture. And when we have a slower shutter speed, it creates this flowy water look. And this is really, really popular with landscape photographers. Here's a couple more examples of long, or some people say slow, shutter speeds. Let's take a quick look. So here again, we have um, this flowy water look, and that comes from having a long shutter speed. And we also have a foreground element, middle ground elements, and background elements. Now here's another example, a long exposure. And so in order to get this person nice and clear and sharp as they are here, that means that that person had to stay completely still the entire time this photo was being taken. If they would have moved at all, we would have seen them, uh, it would almost look like a ghostly type of figure. Would have, you would have seen some motion going here. So this person stood still while they took this photo. All right, and one more example, some waterfalls in Iceland. Um, so this one, again, we have a very long exposure, long shutter speed, in order to have this flowy water look. All right, so let's talk about light for a second. So many people think that landscape photography is easy because you're just capturing what's in front of you, right? But the truth is that the very best landscape photos require patience. Professionals wait for the right light and weather conditions, and sometimes they'll return to a scene over and over and over again until those conditions happen. I know some photographers who wake up at 2 in the morning to hike out to the location and be ready to where they want to shoot for when the, when the sun comes up. Now let's say they did all that and it was a cloudy morning and the sun didn't come up and hit the mountains exactly like they wanted. Well then, they pack up, go back home, and try again. So even though, yes, it's easy to go out in nature and just take a photo, waiting for that light and those um, and hiking out to those points of view where not a lot of people get to is really what makes those really beautiful, striking landscape photographs. Along with that, we have different types of light. And two types of light that are really, really um, that really work well for landscape photography is going to be the golden hour and the blue hour. So here is, is an example of the golden hour. We can see this beautiful golden light and what's creating this light is that the sun is a lot lower on the horizon and so that golden light is cutting through the atmosphere and hitting these mountains just beautifully. You'll also notice with this photo we have that foreground element, that middle ground, and the background. So um, the golden hour is the time right after sunrise or right before sunset. Depending on where you live and the time of year, golden hour can last 15 minutes to an hour, um, but if you get into more extreme situations, like really north, like really north in Alaska, there's times of the year where golden hour lasts a lot, lot longer. Um, so it really depends on where you live. Paying attention to what the light is around, like around you during uh, right before sunset will give you a better idea of when you need to get to a location to get a great photo. So some tips are that if you photograph uh, facing away from the sun, you can catch some really great light happening on your subject. So that's when the sun, let's say, is across, and this would be an example right up here. So they're not 
Um, they're not photographing at the sunset. The sun is setting over here. They're photographing away from the sunset so that they can catch the light that's hitting all these mountains. You can also photograph facing the sunset sunrise and that will create uh, silhouettes, especially if you're using people. You can have, if, if you have them standing and then they're blocking the sun, it'll create a silhouette around them, which is really popular um, in landscape photography, but especially in portrait photography, FYI. So we also have the blue hour. And here is another great example of the blue hour. So the blue hour is the time right before the sun is rising or when the sun or when the sun has just set. And again, depending on where you live and the time of year, the blue hour can last 15 minutes to an hour. During this time, light is bouncing around the atmosphere, so the light is very even, as in it's non-directional. So let's take a look. So you can see that um, the light, the sun is setting right back here, but it's there's not really uh, hard shadows anywhere. I mean, there is a bit of shadows on the rocks and such, but the light is bouncing around, and so we're not getting super directional light. This is also a really good time to start photographing street scenes because the brightness of the sky is lower and the street lights are coming on. So you don't get this really harsh contrastiness any, anymore. Uh, everything is kind of balanced out. So during the golden hour and the blue hour, the light changes dramatically. When you shoot opposite of the sunset, you can catch some beautiful pinks, purples, and blues in the sky. So this is a, a shoot of um, a while back when I was in San Francisco, and I was hoping to catch maybe the sun hitting the Golden Gate Bridge and giving it a golden look. Um, unfortunately, there was a bunch of clouds in the sky, so I didn't quite get that. So instead, I just stuck around for the blue hour and waited for the lights to come up on the bridge instead. So let's take a look at these photos. So this is right before the golden hour is starting. Um, my shutter speed is pretty fast. You can see that the wave is caught in motion, frozen in motion, and but it's not really that interesting of a photo. Here you can see the golden hour has started, but like I said, there was some uh, there was some clouds, so that was blocking it, and we're just hit, seeing a little bit of that golden light hitting right here. But for the most part, the golden light that day wasn't hitting the bridge how I was hoping. All right, so I waited a bit longer, and also just to let you guys know, um, especially when you're out photographing um, landmarks like this that are really popular it can be really helpful to show up early because other photographers might show up. And so if you want to get a great place, a great composition, you want to show up early and stake out your spot. So I had gotten to the bridge, I think about an hour before the, before the sun started setting in order to do this. And now if you notice right down here, you're seeing that we're not having that frozen look of the water anymore. It's starting to get flowier. So what's going on is that the light is going down, the sun is pretty much uh, finishing setting, we're starting to enter the blue hour, and because there's not as much light, I had to make some decisions. Either I have to open up my aperture to let more light in, or I have to slow down my shutter speed to let more light in, or I have to take my ISO higher to make my um, sensor more sensitive to light. I generally try to keep my ISO as low as possible and I wanted to keep my aperture really small so I can get this part of the bridge all the way to back here nice and in focus. So that meant that it was going to be changing my shutter speed and making it slower and slower and slower in order to let more light in as the sun set and there wasn't, a, a, there wasn't as much light bouncing around the atmosphere. So you can see here, same thing, we're starting to get these pinkish and purples and the light, the water is starting to get that flowy look. Same, and you can see there's some splashes that happened here. So that's something to uh, think about when you're photographing around water is to check your lens and clean your lens off every so often. And now we're really starting to get these really pretty pinks and purples.
And as you guys, as I'm going through these, um, you'll start seeing that again, the water starts getting that more flowy look as I go even slower. Okay, so at this point, I really slowed down from here. I was like, okay, maybe I can get somewhat of a silhouette. And then I slowed down the shutter speed even more. So this is, you know, it's technically it's darker when I took this photo, but by slowing down that shutter speed, I'm letting more light in. And so we have a brighter exposure. You can also see that the lights are starting to turn on on the bridge. Now those pinks and purples are going away and we are officially entering into that blue hour. All right, my shutter speed is getting really slow now and you can see that um, whatever waves there were are just not even really visible at all. And we're starting to get this really nice golden glow coming off onto the water. All right, now it's getting really dark. The lights are coming up and if you notice, I'm starting to get these um, the lights are having like these starburst looking effect and that comes also from using that small aperture and the stars are going to look different depending on your lens and how many blades are part of your lens. Okay all the lights are coming up we have this beautiful glow coming down here from the lights. And this last photo, <laughs> this last photo is kind of a cautionary tale. So as I was photographing um, the bridge, I decided, I got to this photo and I was like, okay, that's looking pretty good. And then it got really dark and I decided to try to change my frame to a horizontal. And as I was standing there taking the photo, I think it was a 30 second exposure at that point, um, a wave hit the rocks in front of me and came up and started crashing down on top of me. So I grabbed my camera, which was on the tripod. So I grabbed my camera and tripod and tried to turn in order to shield the waves from hitting my gear. Unfortunately, I was completely soaked. My camera was soaked, my tripod, my bag was open, everything was soaked. Um, but what happened here is that when I grabbed my camera, I made a slight movement to the side and then a, and then another movement to this side. So I went slightly to the right and then to the left really hard. And that's what created these light trails going back and forth. So um, if you guys have ever seen those light trail photos of like cars or something, that's what it is, is using a really slow shutter speed to capture the movement of the light in the scene. In this uh, instance, I was the one that was moving, and so I created the movement of the lights. I, to tell you the truth, I have no idea what this white light is, and it freaks me out a little, because there was nothing out there <laughs> that I remember. Um, but yeah, and uh, this actually ended up being one of my favorite photos, and as you can tell, I did Photoshop out that white light, freaky white light, by using the retouching tools that um, I showed you in the previous weeks. Okay, let's move on. So that's an example of looking away from the sunset or um, yeah, basically away from the sunset. Now you can also shoot towards the sunset, but you really wanna be careful because shooting the sun can still damage your eyes just like looking at the sun and it can damage your camera sensor. If you have been photographing the sun and then you realize whenever you take a photo there's a dark area on every photo you take, that might be why. Your camera sensor might have been damaged. So we're going to look at some more photos and this is looking towards the sunset and this is going over about an hour so we're going to see how dramatic that golden light starts to become. And if you notice, um, I am not I am not shooting with the sun directly in my photo. The sun was setting right up, up above this area and I purposely was trying to keep the sun out of my frame of view. So this is here at Pismo Beach. I'm sure most of us have been there. And there's these little things that have washed up on shore so I knew I wanted to use them in my photo. So you can see there is this golden light 
and you can see the shadows and as we go through these you'll see the shadows start to get longer and longer and longer and that's because the sun is getting slow, slowly getting down towards the horizon and making the shadows go longer to the side. And here again trying to use foreground elements, middle ground elements, background elements. You can see how long that shadow is getting there from just a few frames ago. And now that golden light is really hitting. And I got down low um, really to try to get the effects of what was going on here. And this was just kind of a happy accident. The surfers started coming out of the waves. So that was kind of fun. And then they were hanging out, so I quickly tried to reframe in order to get them. And again, we have that foreground element, middle ground, background. And now the, the sun has just gone under here, and so we still have a little bit of that golden light peeking through. Um, but I'm not in danger of hurting my eyes by looking into the sun anymore. Okay, we're starting to slowly transition into the blue hour. We're getting these really nice purples and such in the sky. And you can even see here where the light is only uh, hitting the top part of these now. And slowly getting into the blue hour, but this is great too. We have a bit of the goldenness, a bit of the blueness and purples. And some more of that. All right, huge difference. And this was just about 45 minutes to an hour, I believe, that it changed so dramatically. All right, so let's look at cityscapes at night for a second. Now, many of the principles we talked about above also apply to cityscapes. But I want to talk about my favorite time to photograph cityscapes, which is at night. I like photographing at night because I feel like um, the light isn't changing anytime soon. Once it gets dark, it's dark. And then it's just really about capturing the lights and having fun with slow shutter speeds and looking at different compositions. So something to note is that getting a technically perfect exposure is near impossible uh, with cityscapes at night because of the high contrast between the night sky and the lights. So I usually use darker shots and then I selectively lighten areas or I composite bright elements like the moon back in. And what I mean is like for instance in this shot, um, we have, um, when I took these photos, this is actually a double panorama, which I'll talk about a little bit more in our next lecture. But the, when I took these photos, in order for there to be enough light to capture the dark areas around here, my moon was completely blown out. So I actually took a photo uh, for just the moon. It was on the same night and everything, but the rest of this was completely dark in order for me to get a nice photo of the moon. And then I added it back in in Photoshop. Uh, let's see. Oh yes, use a tripod to avoid high ISO. Um, AKA high grain or noise. So you can see that that's something that's consistently that we're talking about is to use a tripod as much it, whenever you can. Now I know um, right now you might not be able to since we're working all online, um, but hopefully in the future we will be able to get back to checking out equipment and you guys will be able to try it out. All right, and again, how I mentioned before, using a small aperture will make the street lights look like little stars, but that does require a slow shutter speed. Slow shutter speeds will show movement like streaks of light from passing cars, and a good way to gauge how long your exposure needs to be is to count how many seconds it takes a car to move through the scene while you're looking through your viewfinder. So if you've set up your camera on a tripod and you wanna make the uh, light the light streaks happen, then look through your viewfinder and when a car enters, start counting 1, 100, 2, 200, 3, 300 to however long it takes to get through and then try setting your shutter speed to that. So um, night scenes with no visible movement tend to feel calmer and more serene. 
So here's some examples of um, my own photos and there's uh, quite a few different places we'll go through. But this first one is in Fresno. This is actually at um, Weber and Clinton before the Vallarta got built right over here. And this is just playing with those long shutter speeds and playing with those streaks of light. So as I took the photo, there was cars going back and forth here, and then all of the lights from the cars look have these little starburst effect going on as well as the street lights. Here's another example um, where the lights are coming through here. So here's some stopped cars, but anything that is moving for a long exposure, you'll be able to show that movement. Another example, um, this is Bluish Hour in San Francisco. And so uh, again, there's not really any movement. There's very slight movement from the people. This guy's turning his head, this guy moved a little bit. But besides that, you really don't have any movement and it has a much calmer feeling than, let's say, this. It feels, you know, you feel the movement, you see the movement of the lights. Okay, here's another shot from Fresno and the Fulton Mall, when it was still the Fulton Mall. And you can see that the water is not frozen. It has that flowy look. So you know that that's a slow shutter speed. You can also see these people back here and um, they were moving, so they have that kind of ghostly effect. So if you want to try doing Halloween photos, by the way, using a slow shutter speed is a great way to create quote unquote ghost photos. Um, this is downtown Fresno again, and this is actually just using the light of a cell phone. There's two people with a cell phone, so one person started back here and was just swirling their cell phone around and around, and then another person was moving their cell phone up and down. Now we don't see the actual people in the photo because the shutter speed is long and they didn't stay in one place long enough to be captured by the camera. Okay, tower district with the lights. Light streaks going on and you can see the um, multiple cars imprinted upon each other. So uh, one for a, a split second there was a car sitting here and then my shutter opened up and there was movement happening and then by the time it closed there was another car that had stopped there. Night shot of Fresno. This is an example of using framing. So this is a compositional technique where you use something else in your foreground to frame your middle ground and background. So this is what it was at the top of the security bank building and so I was able to look through this um, window, which I thought was a pretty cool frame. Okay, again, this is slow shutter speed. So it's so slow that the water here looks very glassy. So if you want that glassy look, slow shutter speed. Uh, sculptures, light sculptures, fun stuff. Again, pretty slow shutter speed, not as glassy as a few, uh, a few photos ago, but you can still see there's a very calmness to this. And this is another example of rule of thirds, where you, if you split this up, it's maybe off just a little bit, but it's pretty close right there, rule of thirds. And then this is probably a little bit off too, but getting pretty close. So just work it worrying or working on not having the um, main part of your photo straight in the middle, because then it makes it hard for your eye to figure out where to go next. This helps there be more flow in your photographs. All right, some more light streaks and fun, uh, fun lights going on at night. And this is an example. Um, this is actually Washington D.C. And I love photographing uh, areas where there's a lot of tourists at night because a lot of times there's not as many tourists there. So when I went here during the day, there was people everywhere. It was near impossible to get a photo without a bunch of people in it. But it came back at night. And now we have, I could take a photo of this monument. And you can tell it's a long shutter speed because you can see the movement in the tree over here from uh, the wind hitting the leaves. Now here is a time where I use my flash. 
So this is a Jefferson Memorial, and I had a flash, and I pointed the flash towards this part of a bridge that said 1908. I thought that was pretty cool. And so I was able to balance the light. This area was really bright. This bridge was completely dark. So by using my flash to just hit this area, I was able to balance the light and come up with this fun photo. Here's another example of framing. And these next photos, you're gonna see that every single one has the Washington Monument in the background, but I'm using, I'm photographing it in different way with different elements. So this photo, I am using framing to um, frame uh, basically something in my foreground in order to look through to see something in the background. So in this case, this is, I think, the Jefferson Memorial again, some of the pillars, and we're seeing the Washington Monument. Okay, here's another example where um, I'm using balance in my composition. I have the Martin Luther King Memorial on this side, and this is strong as it is, but then having another element on this side balances the two sides of the composition. All right, so this photo, again, Washington Monument, looking from the Lincoln um, Memorial. And you can see the water, we can see the people, slow shutter speed, the sky slightly moved. And when you photograph in a horse, I'm sorry, a vertical orientation, so vertical or portrait is where the long side is the height, then you give more power to your subject. So if my subject, if you're thinking of the subject as being the memorial or meaning the monument, it gives it a more powerful look. This is the exact same scene but instead of uh, photographing it horizontally, so horizontal or landscape mode is when um, the width is the longest area. And now with this, this doesn't have as much of that power type of feel as the previous photo, but you can see that I am using the rule of thirds and the sky has become much more important. And last but not least, we have the Vietnam Memorial. And we're using um, this memorial as what's called leading as what's called leading lines. So leading lines are lines in a composition that move you from one area to the background. So this is a perfect example. All the lines here are leading straight back to the Washington Memorial. So sometimes we're in places where we can't use um, a tripod, or maybe you don't have a tripod. So if you're hand holding your camera, you can open up your aperture as wide as possible so you can use a faster shutter speed. For extra stability, you can also lean on something for support, or what's called cradling your camera by using your right hand to hold the camera body and to change settings while your left hand is holding the lens and your arms are tight against your body. I'm going to show you exactly what this looks like in the next lecture on shooting panoramas. But here's a couple examples. So um, Fremont Street in Las Vegas is such a fun place to hang out, so many great lights and so many photographic possibilities, but they don't allow tripods because it's touristy, there's a lot of people, it's a health uh, risk. Uh, hazard, I guess. So you can't use a tripod, so what do you do? Well, like I said, um, go ahead, open up that aperture, get a faster shutter speed. And you can still play with trying to stay as uh, trying to stay as still as possible and taking photos. And if you try it a couple times, it doesn't work. Well, it's okay. Just try it out anyways. So here's an example and where we're also using a slow shutter speed. You can see from this car, um, we're using framing, the Fremont, the Fremont East District sign to frame everything that's going on in here. Now here's a photo where I'm using the crowd as kind of the basis down here and then using the rest up here um, to be the main subject of my photo. Another fun thing you can do is what's called panning. And if you've ever heard of panning, most people do it from side to side. You can also do it and try walking. Now, if you do this, you want to make sure that maybe you're with someone, 
that's going to be there in case you start to stumble and you have maybe a free and clear area in front of you. But in this case, I was trying to walk at the same speed as this person here. And if I'm walking the same speed then he, and I take the photo, then he will be um, more clear and in focus and the people on the sides will be um, a bit blurred. And just one more shot, one good old Vegas shot. Oh, last one. Uh, remember when I talked about the bridge and using the flash? Well, I did the same thing with this one. Um, I had all of these lights happening over here, so there was plenty of light over here, but I also wanted to get the graffiti that was on the back of um, the walking signals. So I had my flash on, turned the flash to be hitting over here, and so took the photo with the flash hitting here and it balanced the light out with light, balanced the light with the photos in the background. All right, and my last tip for photographing landscapes or cityscapes is to be safe and bring a friend. Um, I don't know about you, but when I'm photographing, I really get into it and that's just everything my brain is thinking about. And so sometimes I start getting distracted or I block out distractions from around me and it can be a little unsafe. So when you're out photographing, make sure you bring someone with you. Um, you bring some snacks to feed them, take them out to dinner afterwards or something. But um, yeah, always be safe and bring a friend. All right, I hope these tips helped out because your next big assignment is gonna be going out and photographing a panorama, which is gonna be a landscape or cityscape.